in the darkest shadows, in the white cold, fearlessly search for knowledge new and old. We drink the strong spirits and read the ancient tomes, the order, the order of the Abercast. We are the brave and bold. <clears throat> The adept from whom Simon learned the art of magic was Diotheus, who pretended to be a messiah foretold by the prophets and who was contemporary with Christ. From the person, he appears to have acquired a great store of occult irradiation and owned his power chiefly from the hysterical conditions to which he was capable of throwing himself. Though through these he was ab- he was enabled to make himself look either old or young, returning at will to childhood or old age. It is evident that he had not been initiated into the transcendental magic, but was merely consumed by a thirst for the power over humanity, and he was and the mysteries of nature repulsed by the apostles. He is said to have undertaken pilgrimages like them in which he permitted himself to be worshipped by the mob. He declared that he himself was the manifestation of the splendor of God. And that Helena, a Greek slave of his, was its reflection Thus he imitated Christianity in the reverse sense, affirmed the eternal reign of evil and revolt, and was, in fact, the Antichrist. This is an encyclopedia of occultism, a compendium of information on the occult sciences, occult personalities, psychic science, magic, demonology, spiritism, mysticism, and metaphysics. By Lewis Spence. It's the entry, part of the entry of Simon Magus, which we are going to talk about right now. The Abercast. Occult. History. Conspiracy. Violence. Hey, I'm John, and this I've been John, and I'm going to be John, and this is going to be the Abercast. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. I appreciate your time. So tonight we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be revisiting Simon Magus, and we're going to be talking about Simon Magus, Magus according to his enemies. I thought that this is an interesting take to revisit the story of Simon Magus, which we have done, um, in the past, in the past. Uh, so with that being said, I would like to encourage everyone to rate and review on iTunes. It's a great way to support the show. Great free way to support the show. Visit the website, stigmatastudios.com or abercast.com. There's social media links down towards the bottom. Hook me up, find me, let me know what you think about this bullshit that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, also, there's a featured topic link, which will have all the episodes that deal with the topics we're going to be dealing with here this evening. So instead of going through and being like, oh, does this one have something to do with Gnosticism or does this one have something to do with Simon Magus? I don't know. Like, you can just go there and find it and listen to all the shows right there. <clears throat> with that being said, mailing list, sign into the mailing list, please. 
Uh, if I would like to encourage you guys to sign the mailing list, please. This show does not have a graphic component, but when we do have a graphic component, uh, the mailing when you sign into the mailing list, it provides you a link to a secret portion of the website that um, you can download the visual portions of uh, the episodes on there. I'm trying to transcend the, the limits of this medium, if you know what I'm saying. So check in, check into the mailing list, and I don't abuse them. I don't abuse the mailing list. Uh, very often so go ahead and check it out and like obviously i don't ever uh give your addresses your email addresses away in all this stuff so you know feel you can feel safe with me bros feel safe with me in the embrace um patreon <clears throat> so you can support us on patreon on top of the fly ass rewards we're trying to get off the ground um there are literally like 13 hours of 13 bone totally brand new bonus episodes on there there's also a ton of old bonus material that you can't find anywhere else except for on patreon now so that's awesome um we have stuff from the emerald tablets of thoth the atlantean we have a whole series on um liber abba uh the first portion of liber abba or magic from uh, alistair crowley it's all about uh the, the mysticism chapter is all up there and then this month is all about we're starting our sex magic thread. So it's all about um, the influence of the phallic idea in uh, religions of uh, of ancient religions. So I thought it would be fun uh, instead of jumping right into sex magic to talk about magic symbolism and some of the stories that we already know and stuff. So that's all there. And another important thing to remember about Patreon is a portion of all the patreon stuff a portion from all the ad revenue that i get from the show and a portion of any donations that i get from the show uh you can find links to patreon and to the donation the paypal donations in the show notes a portion of all that stuff goes to donating books and media to sol u.s soldiers deployed overseas um we've sent i don't know good i don't know I, I don't really have a number. I want to guess like 10, 13 books over there for, uh, for soldiers. Um, and I would love to send more. I'd love to send more. I just need, I need more support. So if you guys are interested in that, uh, Patreon is a good place to do it. And I always try to keep you guys up to date on what we're sending. And I can't say where, because you were not allowed to publish their addresses. You got to go through like a, you got to go through a screening process or something. So I can't say like where I say we've, it's all been to Afghanistan so far and that's as close as I can get. There's operational security that needs to be uh, observed here. You know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so with that being said, let's go. We're going to get into this. Um, Tomes for Troopers, yeah, Patreon, okay. Mailing list, check, website, rate and review. Okay, I've checked all the boxes, now let's go. Tonight we're going to be talking about um, a book called Fragments of a Faith Forgotten by G.R.S. Mead. So, the Nag Hammadi text wasn't um, discovered until... I want to say the 40s. And this book was written in the 19... It was written in 19... Well, it was published in 1900. So this this book, A Fragment of a Faith Forgotten, was one of the, the books about Gnosticism before the Nag Hammadi was discovered. So it's called A Fragments of a Faith Forgotten. There's also another one... I can't remember what the other one was called. There's one, There's one or two of these books that are like talks about Gnosticism and it talks about Gnosticism the only way that it could from the time uh, it, it was pointed or from the point of view of their of the Gnostics enemies which is the Catholic Church so um, 
Yeah. So here we go. This is just from the, uh, this is from the introduction of the book. So now is a good time. My, my fellows, the Knights of the order, if you would like to man your Mason jars and you know, the enact this secret formula, you know what the formula is, uh, the formula for the weapon of mass distraction. I would like you to whip up your gin jihad with me. We're going to get into this book. You've been warned. You charge your glass, dude. My glass is right here. I'm ready to go. I'm already halfway going into it. Fragments of a Faith Forgotten by G.R.S. Mead, 1900. This is from the introduction. This is the best... <clears throat> Sorry. This is one of the best books about the Gnostics written prior to the Nag Hammadi discoveries. G.R.S. Mead, who also translated the Fistus Sophia, summarizes what was known about the Gnostics at the turn of the 20th century. At the time, a better picture of the Gnostics was emerging based on several papyri, which had been recently discovered. Although there had been a lot of academic research on the subject, most of the key works were in German or French. Therefore, in this book, the Gnostics and their remains were the only two major books in this book and the, okay. So that's the other book I was talking about. Therefore, this book and the Gnostics and their remains were the only two major books in English, uh, that, uh, the subject cr on the subject that was, oh God, subject currently in the public domain. It was becoming increasingly obvious that early Christianity was wide spectrum of, was a wide spectrum of sex and records of which had been subsequently forgotten or suppressed by <laughs> subsequently forgotten <clears throat> or suppressed by the church. The Gnostics had a deep connection with ancient mystery religions, Pythagorism, Hinduism, and the ancient beliefs. Most of the sacred texts of Gnosticism were long lost or survived only in small quotes. Whenever we talk about Gnosticism, we run into this quote business because these papyruses had been de uh uh, degenerated they've been uh, cr uh the content had been cr crippled to sometimes you can only get like a partial portion of a of a sentence or something out of out of each each one of these so yeah i mean i'm validating this mead draws on information provided both by early church fathers hostile to gnosticism and the available corpus of actual gnostic documents at the time christianity and fragmentary as it was he includes excerpts from previously untranslated manuscripts and extensive summaries uh, of the Pistis Sophia and the writings of the critics of the Gnosticism. The book was required reading for anyone who wanted to understand Gnosticism and the development of early Christianity. So before we get into Simon Magnus, I thought we could stop here briefly and talk about the Simonians, the origin of the name. There is no reason to suppose that the Gnostics, whom the church fathers called Simonians, would have themselves answered to that name or have recognized the line of descent a man imagined for them by their opponents as founded on any basis. In fact, as early as Justin Martyr, which was uh, circa 150 AD, Simon assumed uh, a prominence out of all proportion to his place in history. Evidently, Simon regarded him with a great detestation. The accused, the Romans, of worshiping him as a god on the strength of his inscription on the statue of Rome. Justin gives the inscription as Simone Dio Sancto to Simon the Holy God. But alas for the reputation of Justin's accuracy when engaged with controversy. 
archaeology was discovered, the statue it finds was dedicated to a Sabine deity, Simo Sanctus. And Justin's assertion, however, was received without question. A subsequent, oh boy, heresiologist, heresiologist was all as such as all such assertions were uh, in the uncritical age. It is now very profitable that ju- it is now very probable that Justin and his innumerable controversies in defense of his particular view of Christianity was met with some argument to which Simon was quoted as an example. It may have been that Justin argued that the miracles of a uh, Jesus uh, proved that all Justin claimed on his behalf was met by the counter argument that Simon also was a great wonder worker and made great claims so that miracles did not prove Justin's connection. Thus, it may have been that Justin grew to detest the memory of Simon uh, and saw him and his supporters everywhere, even at Rome, and the statue uh, to a Sabine godling. It may well have been that some wonder worker called Simon may have astonished people in Samaria with his psychological tricks and this story were still in Justin's time told of him among the people. But this, uh, but what did most to stereotype this legend that Simon was the first heretic was the insertion of his name in one of the stories included in the subsequently canonical acts of the apostles. This took place later than Justin, so we have the first moment of evolution of the legend of the origin of heresy. (laughs) That sounds like a fucking heavy metal album if I've ever heard it. The first moments of the evolution of the legend of the origin of heresy. Okay. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to compose a whole song right now. The, and therefore, according to the fathers of Gnosticism, when, uh, what then is told about Simon and the Simonians is only of interest for a recovery of some of the ideas, uh, which the subsequent Catholic party was striving to convert. It has no value in history. All right, so Fragments of Faith Forgotten by G.R.S. Mead. Simon Magus. Here, here. The first heretic. Here, here. Grab your fucking glasses and toast to the first heretic. Here, here. Your bottles of pop, your bottles of soda, your bottles of water, whatever you got, your wine, your water bottles, whatever. Let's toast to Simon Magus, the first heretic. Hear, hear. Simon Magus, as we've already said, is mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles, a document of the New Testament collection said not to be quoted prior to 177 A.D. Irenaeus and his successor repeat the Acts legend. Justin Martyr, circa 150, speaks of uh, of a certain Simon of Gita, whom nearly all Sumerians regarded with the greatest reverence. This Simon has said, um, he said, claimed to be an incarnation of a great power. And many followers, Justin, however, makes no reference to the Acts story. And so some have assumed two Simons. But this does not seem necessary. The Justin account is the nucleus of the huge Simonian legend, which was mainly developed in the cycle of pseudo-Clementine literature to the 3rd century, based on the 2nd century Circuitus of Peter. Hippolytus alone at the beginning of the third century had, um, uh, hold on, fat, dry, fat, dry fingers, 
has preserved a few scraps from the extensive extensive literature from the Simonians. The Bishop of Portus quotes from a work entitled The Great Announcement. We're going to hear a lot about this great announcement through this episode. And so we are able to form some idea of one of the systems of these Gnostics. The scheme of the Gnosis contained in this document so far from um, presenting a crude form uh, or mere germ, the Gnostic doctrine hands on to us a highly developed phase of Gnostic tradition, which though not so elaborate as the Valentinian system, nevertheless and almost as mature as the Barbello scheme, referred to as curiously by Arianius, and now partly recovered in the newly discovered Gospel of Mary. Mary, Mary. In the earliest times to which Catholic Christians subsequently traced the origin of their tradition, the Ebonite Simon, there was, as we know from various sources, numerous movements in and about Palestine of a prophetical or and reformatory nat- nature. Many prophets and teachers of ethical, mystical, religio-philosophical, and Gnostic doctrine, the Ebonite communities found themselves in conflict with the followers of these teachers on many points, and the Ebonite trad Ebonite tradition handed on the garbled account of these doctoral conflicts. Of all things, the Ebonites were in a bitter strife with the Pauline churches. Later on, general Christianity set itself to work to reconcile Peterine and Pauline differences. They're still doing that to this day, principally uh, by the Acts document and In course of time, Ebonite tradition uh, has also edited by the light of the new view and the name Simon substituted for the great heretic of whom the Ebonites have striven. And also modified Ebonite tradition, which was presumably first committed to writing the Circuitus of Peter, gradually evolved a romance in which the conflicts between Simon Peter, the Ebonite, and Simon the Magician were graphically portrayed. The magical arts of the cemeterian are foiled, and this false theology is exposed by the drought, or sorry, by the doughty champion of the poor men. The latest recension of this cycle of romance gave the whole a Roman setting. And so we find Simon finally routed by Peter at Rome. But in earlier recession, Peter does not travel beyond the East and Simon is finally routed at Antioch. A close inspection of the pseudo Clementine literature reveals a number of the literary deposits or strata of legend one of which are very remarkable in nature. Bauer was the first to point this out, and his followers, the tu, Tuben, 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 Tubingen school, elaborated of his views on this theory that Simon Magnus is simple or is simply the legendary symbol for Paul. So he's saying that they're both the same person. The remarkable similarity in the doctoral points at scholarly reputation of the Tubigen school uh, puts out the court of Aeor Pori in possibility. Although, of course, it would not be prudent to take extreme view of that whenever Simon Magus is mentioned. Paul is meant nevertheless. We may not unclearly distinguish this identity in a least of the strata of the legend. The Simonian systems is described by the fathers, reveal the main features of the Gnostic, the father overall, the logos idea, the aeon world, the ideal universe. It's a man's, uh, it's emanation and it's pot 
and its positive and negative aspects represented as a pair of the Simonian literature. Sigises, the world soul represented as though or as thought or female aspect of the logos, the descent of the soul and the creation of the sensible world by the builders of the doctrine of reincarnation, redemption, etc. The main characteristics of the Simonians is said to have been the practice of magic, which Simon is reported to have learned in Egypt and which is, gave to rise the most of the fantastic stories invented by their opponents. But it's very probable that the title Magus covers much more than the story of the Sumerian wonder worker. It puts us in touch with the Gnostic link with Persia and the Magi and indeed the fire symbolism used in the MS quoted from Hippolytus apply confirms amply confirms this hypothesis in other respects the Simonian Gnosis was on a similar lines between Barbello Gnostic and Basilo Valentinian developments this is to be clearly seen in the fragments of the great announcement preserved by Hippolytus the rest of the Simonian literature has perished one of their chief documents, however, was a book called The Four Quarters of the World, and another famous treatise contained a number of controversial points ascribed to Simon, which submitted the idea that the God of the Old Testament to a searching criticism, especially dealing with the serpent legend in Genesis, the main symbolism which evolvers of the Simonian legend parodied in the myth of Simon and Helen appeared to have been Sidriel. Uh, if you want to know more about this, like literally, it's just popping up in the reading, but <laughs> the Patreon episodes of the phallic idea, the sex magic thing, it is dealing with this. They actually mentioned Sidriel in there. Go check it out. It's just $3. You're not going to fucking miss it. Just go check it out. Thus the Logos, the Logos and his thought and the world soul were symbolized as the sun, Simon and the moon, Selene or Helene or Helen. Uh, so with the microcosm, Helen was the human soul fallen into matter and Simon, the mind, which brings about her redemption. Moreover, was one of the symptoms appears to have adept adapted to interpret the Trojan legend in the myth of Helen in a spiritual and psychological fashion. And to all my brothers and sisters out there who's asking, Pastor Larry Solomon, what do you know about it? What do you know about love? Well, I'm here to tell you, you youngsters, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you teenagers, and all of you, I know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about love. About the eternal love. and everlasting love of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Can Jesus Christ get an amen? What you all are talking about isn't love. It's lust. It's the unrighteous lust of the flesh, of the physical of body. You are talking about unclean and unholy thoughts, nakedness and sin, touching those sweated bosoms instead of asking, please, Jesus, forgive my sins. You asking, why? Why can't I get just one kiss? You should be asking for a kiss on the lips from the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, can I get an amen? Instead of asking for the Lord to save your black, a dog, dookie stained soul, you're asking, why? Why can't I get just one screw? 
You should be thinking about Jesus screwed up on that wooden cross up on Calvary instead of asking for eternal life after the death of your broken, your fat body, your filthy body. You're asking why? Why can't I get just one fornication? You boy. You better turn on your TV and watch Face of the Nation. Can I get an amen for learning something? Amen, amen. Learn some current events. And you, you sister, why are you down there going, learn about the influence of the phallic idea and the religions of antiquity? Where do you go to learn about it? I'll tell you where. Three episodes on the $3 tier and a bonus episode on the $5 tier of the Abercast Patreon page. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Hey, man. Hey, we're letting you guys know what's going on with uh, Tomes for Troopers uh, this month. Uh, we had a... Mm, fuck, we actually had a... We had an Air Force person. We had an airman... Uh, requesting specifically a uh, request respectfully request Dungeons and Dragons rule book. He said that he wanted edition five, but any would do. So we went in, down and we actually tracked down the core rule book and the monster manual fifth edition for him and sent it out and sent it out to him. So, uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, that's what we we have done, <laughs> uh, with Tomes for Troopers this month. It's a little on the sad side. Sometimes you only get to send one or two books out a month, but right now it's the limitations of the, of the support. So, um, if you want to, if you want to help out with Tomes for Troops, uh, Patreon, uh, you can, there's a donate link right there in the show notes and whatever money I get from the ad revenue monthly, a portion of all those things goes to, goes towards, um, these Tomes, Tomes for Troopers. So here we go. Like we've sent out a bunch of stuff. This is the first time we sent out Dungeons and Dragons though. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. Pretty excited about that. <clears throat> this is interesting, uh, showing an attempt to evoke the authority of the popular Greek Bible in the cycle of Homeric legend. The support of Gnostic ideas. It was an extension of the method of the Jewish allegorizers into the domain of Greek mythology. The detractors of the Simonians among the church fathers, however, evolved the legend that Helen was a prostitute whom Simon had picked up in Tyre. The name of the city presumably led Bauer to suggest that Simon and Helen uh, terminology is connected with the Phoenician cult of the sun and moon deities, which is still practiced in that ancient city. Doubtless, the old Phoenicians and Syrian ideas of cosmogony are familiar with many students of the religion at that period. But we need to be precise in the matter so obscure. The Simonian system of Irenaeus gives the following outline of the system as described to the Simonians. It is a dramatic myth of the Logos and the world soul, the Sophia, or wisdom. Irenaeus, uh, however, would have <clears throat> would have it that it was the personal claim of Simon concerning Helen. He evidently bases himself on a MS in which Christ as the logos and representative in speaking in the first person, and he shall therefore endeavor to restore it partially in its original form. Here we go. Quote, hold on. Before I quote anything, I'd like to lubricate. Oh, God. <clears throat> Wisdom was the first... We've... We actually touched on this in the Simon Magus episode. Wisdom is the first conception or thought of my mind, the mother of all, by whom... 
in the beginning, I conceived in my mind the making of the angels and archangels, this thought leaping forth from me. And knowing that was the will of her father descended onto the lower regions and generated in the angels and the powers by whom also the world was made. And after she had generated them, she was detained by them through envy, for they did not wish to be thought the progeny of any other. As for myself, I am entirely unknown to them. And thought, sorry, close quote, and thought, continues Arianius, surmising from the MS, quote, was made prisoner by the powers and angels and had been emanated by her. And she suffered every kind of indignity at their hands to pre to prevent her receding to her father, even to being imprisoned in the human body and transmigrating into other female bodies as from one vessel to another. So she transmigrating from body to body and therefore also continually undergoing indignity. Last of all, even stood for hire in a brothel. And she was the lost sheep. Wherefore also I come to take her away for the time and free her from her bonds to make sure salvation to men by my gnosis. As for the angels, writes the church father, were mismanaging the world since each of them desired the sovereignty he had come to set matters right and he had descended transforming himself and being made like to the powers and principalities and the angels so he appeared to men as a man although he was not a man he was thought to have suffered in judea although he did not really suffer. And the prophets, moreover, had spoken their prophecies under the inspiration of the, the angels who made the world. God made the world, right? Isn't that what they always fucking say? Hi, baby kitty. Hi, baby kitty. <clears throat> All of the doctrines proceeded from circles who believe that the mystical Christ and are common to many other systems of Irenaeus had only told us the history of the document which he was summarizing and glossing. If he had but copied it verbally, how much labor would he have saved posterely? True! He may have been copying them from Justin's controversial writings, and Justin had already done some summarizing and commenting, but in any case, a single paragraph of the original would have given us a better ground on which to form a judgment than the paraphrasing and rhetoric of the two ancient worthies who so cordially detested the Gnostics. The great announcement. Fortunately, Hippolytus, who came later, is more connected in his quotations and occasionally copies Virgil verbally portions of the MSS. Hold on. I got to save this cat for a second. What are you doing? Get down. Come on. What are you doing? Go. God damn. I said, God damn. <clears throat> Unfortunately, or sorry, fortunately, Hippolytus, who later came in more correct to his quotations and occasionally copied verbal portions to the MSS, which had come into his hands. One of these erroneously attributes to Simon himself, presumably. God damn it. What is this? Go. Presumably because he considers it the oldest Gnostic manuscript in his possession. Most critics, however, considered it a later form of the Gnostic 
fat fingers. <laughs> then the system summarized by Irianius. There are, uh, but there is nothing to warrant this assumption by this time. The legend that Simon was the first heretic and had become history in the Heriel, oh boy, heresiologists, uh, and no doubt Hippolytus felt himself fully justified in ascribing to the concept of the manuscript of the MS uh, to one whom supposed the oldest leader of the Gnosis. The title of MS, what the title of the manuscript was the great announcement, probably a synonym, a synonym for the, not the gospel in the Baldarian sent Hold on, Basilidian sense of the term, and it opened with the following words, quote, This is the writing of the revelation of the voice and name and thought of the great power, the boundless, wherefore shall be sealed, hidden, concealed, laid in the dwelling of which the universal root is the foundation, unquote. The dwelling is said to be a man in the temple of the Holy Spirit and a symbol of the boundless, the hidden fire, power, and universal root was fire. Fire was conceived as being of a twofold nature, the concealed and the manifested. The concealed parts of the fire were hidden and the manifested of the manifest in the manifested produced by the concealed the manifest side of the fire has all things in itself which a man perceive of things visible or which he unconsciously fails to perceive whereas the concealed side of everything which one can conceive is intelligible even though it escapes sensation or which man fails to conceive. <clears throat> Before we come to direct quotation, however, Hippolytus treats us to a lengthy summary of the Gnostic exposition before him, from which we may take the following as representing the thought of the writer of the manuscript less erroneously than the rest of all things that are concealed and manifested the fire tree the fire which is above the heavens the treasure house as it were great the tree from which all flesh is nourished the manifested side of the fire is the trunk branches leaves and the outside bark all of these parts of the great tree are sent on fire from the all devouring flame of the fire and destroyed but the fruit of the tree if its imagining has been perfected and takes shape of itself is placed in the storehouse it is not cast in the fire for the fruit is produced and placed in the storehouse, but the husk is to be committed to the fire. That is to say, the trunk, which is generated not for its own sake, but for that of the fruit. The symbolism is of great interest as uh, revealing points of contact with trees and treasures. This also ties into the Patreon <laughs> episodes of this month. The sexy stuff. I'm talking about the sexy stuff. <clears throat> the elaborate systems recoverable from the Coptic Gnostics work with also, also with the line of tradition of the Chaldeans and, and Zoroastrians Logia which were favorite studies of so many later platonic schools, the fruit of the fire tree and the flower of fire. It's like fucking Mario brothers are the symbols of among other things, a man, immortal and garnered spiritual consciousness of the man plant 
It's like fucking Swamp Thing. But the further interpretations of the graphic symbolism would include the genesis of the cosmos and the divining of man. Man uh, is the subject of the generation and suffering so long as he remains in potentiality. But once this... Uh, once his imaging forth is accomplished, he becomes like unto God and freed. He's freed from the bonds of suffering and birth and he obtains protect perfection. But our quotations from the great announcement taken apparently from the beginning of the treaties immediately following the superscription Quote, to you, therefore, I say, what I say, I write, and what I write, the writings, is this. Of universal aeons, there are two growths, without being or end, springing from one aeon, the root which the power silence invisible and incomprehensible, Of these, one appears from above in the great power, the universal mind, ordering all things male and all other from below the great thought or conception female, producing all things, hence matching each other. They unite and manifest this middle space, incomprehensible air, Without beginning or end, this heir is the second father who sustains and nourishes all things which have a beginning and an end. This father is he who stood, stands, and will stand the male-female power like the pre-existing boundless power which has neither beginning nor end, existing in oneness, It was from boundless power that thought, which had previously been hidden in oneness, has proceeded and became twain. He was one, having her in himself, was alone, yet he was not first, though pre-existing. From it was only... When he manifested to himself from himself that he was a second or he was called father before thought called him father. As therefore producing himself by himself, he manifested to himself his own thought so that also his manifested thought did not make the father, but contemplating him, hid him. That is, his power in herself is male-female power and thought. Hence they match each other, being one, for there is no difference between power and thought. From the thing that is discovered, power, from those below thought. Thus it has come to pass that this which is manifested from them through one is found to be two, male and female. Through the female itself, equally so, is mind and thought. They really are one, but only separated from each other when they appear as two. So much for the great announcement of Simon. This document may yet discover, which will throw fresh light on the subject. It is not a responsibility in the meantime. We can reserve our judgment and regard all positive statements that Simon was the firstborn son of Satan as foreign to the question. All right, 
I've been John, and this has been the Abercast. And uh, thank you guys for listening, for tuning in. I uh, encourage you guys to rate and review on iTunes, please. Hold on, I gotta get. Check out the website, stigmatastudios.com or abercast.com. There's social media links at the bottom. Uh, you can also sign on to the newsletter there. <clears throat> if you sign on to the newsletter, you get a link that'll take you to a secret part of the website that has um, uh, graphics, graphic content, not graphic content, like literally drawn a picture content, <laughs> content of some of um, components of some of our episodes. Uh, the one this month is the tarot card episode. So there you go. Um, and uh, Patreon. Patreon, on top of getting, like, the cool reward tiers, you actually, like, there's, like, f- I don't know, 13 or 15. 15- 13 well, i'll just say 10 because i don't know 10 13 or 10 uh exclusive modern episodes within the last three months like it's a ton like literally the mainstream feed has been it's the tip of the iceberg <clears throat> so you can get there and get to those and then get the free reward get the rewards and stuff when you go there and uh the, the most important thing about the Patreon, or if you want to donate, there's a donate link in the show notes, or just the um, ad revenue, uh, is a portion of all that stuff goes for Tomes for Troopers, which is where we send books and media to um, deployed service people over uh, They're deployed. They're overseas. But we send them uh, books and stuff. Uh, they write down like what they're looking for and we track them down and, and send it to them. So we, we've sent a good, probably 10, uh, 10 items, 10 books or mediums o- uh, over the the last few months. And we like to send more. The problem is, is we're, we're looking for help. We're waiting. We're looking for help. So if you want to help f- with that, like if you've ever been deployed, you know what it's like watching Ford Fairlane every waking moment for fucking two weeks of your life or something like that. <laughs> or if you've ever had to pass an uh, afternoon alone, sober, <laughs> without a book, <laughs> and you're like, God damn, I know exactly what that's like. And you want to help somebody, like the Patreon is a, is a great place to, to start for us. So, all right, that's it. This is it. We're done. We're going to do this, and then we're going to get into uh, fucking fight. We're going to do fucking fight by Soda Jerk, just like always. Vienna. 1683. Today is September 11th, 1683. The mighty army of the Ottoman Empire led by the savage and radical terror troops of the Dar al-Harb surround the walled city of Vienna and begin a siege to break the golden apple of Europe and kill, enslave, or convert all of its inhabitants. The valiant citizens stand against the tyrannical army with the steadfast leadership of Count Ernst Rüdiger von Stromberg the help of the ever-living rebel, Cyrus, the dead guy, and the hopes of the faraway King Jan Sobieski III and his army of flying hussars. The Vienna 1683 comic is available right now from Stigmata Studios at stigmatastudios.com and on indieplanet.us. The Non-Standard Squad, 1944 World War II Three weird American soldiers are on a search and rescue mission into the oldest and darkest regions of Europe. A cursed ever-living warrior, Cyrus the Dead Guy. An experimental war bot, Sergeant Lane McCord. An all-red axe, mysterious rogue with a demon-possessed arm come face to face with an army of magically corrupted machine-obsessed elves a magic hammer wielding Norse ubermensch, and a Nazi wizard 
who was a member of the ancient Dark Order of the Shining Hexagon. The non-standard Squad 1944 comic is available right now from Stigmata Studios at stigmatastudios.com and on indieplanet.us. Shot of whiskey 